In a very short time after I went to live at Baltimore, my old master's youngest son, Richard, died. And in about three years and six months after his death, my old master, Captain Anthony, died, leaving only his son, Andrew, and daughter, Lucretia, to share his estate. He died while on visit to see his daughter at Hillsborough. Cut off thus unexpectedly, he left no will as to the disposal of his property. It was therefore necessary to have a valuation of the property, that it might be equally divided between Mrs. Lucretia and Master Andrew. I was immediately sent for, to be valued with the other property. Here again my feelings rose up in detestation of slavery. I had now a new conception of my degraded condition. Prior to this I had become, if not insensible to my lot, at least partly so. I left Baltimore with a young heart overborne with sadness and a soul full of apprehension. I took passage with Captain Rowe in the schooner Wildcat, and after a sail of about 24 hours, I found myself near the place of my birth. I had now been absent from it almost, if not quite, five years. I, however, remembered the place very well. I was only about five years old when I left it to go and live with my old master on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, so that I now was between 10 and 11 years old. We were all ranked together at the valuation, men and women, old and young, married and single, were ranked with horses, sheep, and swine. There were horses and men, cattle and women, pigs and children, all holding the same rank on the scale of being, and were all subjected to the same narrow examination. Silvery-headed age and sprightly youth, maids and matrons had to undergo the same indelicate inspection. At this moment, I saw more clearly than ever the brutal effects of slavery upon both the slave and the slaveholder. After the valuation, then came the division. I have no language to express the high excitement and deep anxiety which were felt among us poor slaves during this time. Our fate for life was now to be decided. We had no more voice in that decision than the brutes among whom we were ranked. A single word from the white men was enough, against all our wishes, prayers, and entreaties, to sunder forever the dear, dearest friends, dearest kindred, and strongest ties known to human beings. In addition to the pain of separation, there was the horrid dread of falling to the hands of Master Andrew. He was known to us all as being a most cruel wretch, a common drunkard who had, by his reckless mismanagement and profligate dissipation, already wasted a large portion of his father's property. We all felt that we might as well be sold at once to the Georgia traders as to pass into his hands, for we knew that that would be our inevitable condition, a condition held by us all in the utmost horror and dread. I suffered more anxiety than most of my fellow slaves. I had known what it was to be kindly treated. They knew nothing of the kind. They had seen little or nothing of the world. They were in very deed men and women of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Their backs had been made familiar with the bloody lash so that they had become callous. Mine was yet tender. For while at Baltimore I got few whippings and few slaves could boast of a kinder master and mistress than myself and the thought of passing out of their hands into those of Master Andrew, a man who but a few days before, to give me a sample of his bloody disposition, took my little brother by the throat, threw him on the ground, and with the heel of his boot, stamped upon his head till the blood gushed from his nose and ears, was well calculated to make me anxious as to my fate. After he had committed this savage outrage upon my brother, he turned to me, and said that that was the way he intended to serve me one of these days, meaning, I suppose, when I came into his possession. Thanks to a kind providence, I fell to the portion of Mrs. Lucretia and was sent immediately back to Baltimore to live again in the family of Master Hugh. Their joy at my return equaled their sorrow at my departure. It was a glad day to me. I had escaped a worse than lion's jaws. I was absent from Baltimore for the purpose of valuation and division just about one month, and it seemed to have been six. Very soon after my return to Baltimore, my mistress Lucretia died, leaving her husband and one child, Amanda. And in a very short time after her death, Mr. Andrew died. Now all the property of my old master, slaves included, was in the hands of strangers, strangers who had had nothing to do with accumulating it. Not a slave was left free. All remained slaves, from the youngest to the oldest. If any one thing in my experience, more than any other, served to deepen my conviction of the infernal character of slavery, 
and to fill me with unutterable loathing of slaveholders. It was their base ingratitude to my poor old grandmother. She had served my old master faithfully from youth to old age. She had been the source of all his wealth. She had peopled his plantation with slaves. She had become a great grandmother in his service. She had rocked him in his infancy, attended him in his childhood, served him through life, and at his death, wiped from his icy cold brow the death sweat and closed his eyes forever. She was nevertheless left a slave, a slave for life, a slave in the hands of strangers, and in their hands she saw her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren divided, like so many sheep. Without being gratified with the small privilege of a single word as to their or her own destiny, and to cap the climax of their base ingratitude and fiendish barbarity, my grandmother, who was now very old, having outlived my old master and all his children, having seen the beginning and end of them all, and her present owners finding she was of but little value, her frame already racked with the pains of old age, and complete helplessness fast stealing over her once active limbs, they took her to the woods, built her a little hut, put up a little mud chimney, and then made her welcome to the privilege of supporting herself there in perfect loneliness, thus virtually turning her out to die. If my poor old grandmother now lives, she lives to suffer in utter loneliness. She lives to remember and mourn over the loss of children, the loss of grandchildren, and the loss of great-grandchildren. They are in the language of the slave poet Whittier, gone, gone, sold, and gone, to the right swap, dank, and lone, where the slave whip ceaseless swings, where the noisome insect stings, where the fear demon strews, poison with the falling dews, with the sickly sunbeams glare through the hot and misty air. Gone, gone, sold and gone, to the ripe swap dank and lone. From Virginia hills and waters, woe is me, my stolen daughters. The hearth is desolate. The children, the unconscious children, who once sang and danced in her presence, are gone. She gropes her way in the darkness of age for a drink of water. Instead of the voices of her children, she hears by day the moans of the dove, and by night the screams of the hideous owl. All is gloom. The grave is at the door. And now when weighed down by the pains and aches of old age, when the head inclines to the feet, when the beginning and the ending of human existence meet, and helpless infancy and painful old age combined together at this time, this most needful time, the time for the exercise of that tenderest and affection which only children can exercise towards a declining parent. My poor old grandmother, the devoted mother of 12 children, is left all alone in yonder little hut before a few dim embers. She stands, she sits, she staggers, she falls, she groans, she dies. And there are none of her children or grandchildren present to wipe from her wrinkled brow the cold sweat of death or to place beneath the sod her fallen remains. Will not a righteous God visit for these things? In about two years after the death of Mrs. Lucretia, Master Thomas married a second wife. Her name was Rowena Hamilton. She was the eldest daughter of Mr. William Hamilton. Master now lived in St. Michael's, not long after his marriage, a misunderstanding took place between himself and Master Hugh, and as a means of punishing his brother, he took me from him to live with himself at St. Michael's. Here I underwent another most painful separation. It, however, was not so severe as the one I dreaded at the division of property, for during this interval a great change had taken place in Master Hugh and his once kind and affectionate wife. The influence of brandy upon him and of slavery upon her had effected a disastrous change in the characters of the both. So that as far as they were concerned, I thought I had little to lose by the change. But it was not to them that I was attached. It was to those little Baltimore boys that I felt the strongest attachment. I had received many good lessons from them and was still receiving them, and the thought of leaving them was painful indeed. I was leaving too without the hope of ever being allowed to return. Master Thomas had said he would never let me return again. The barrier betwixt himself and brother he considered impassable. I then had to regret that I did not at least make the attempt to carry out my resolution to run away, for the chances of success are tenfold greater from the city than from the country. I sailed from Baltimore for St. Michael's in the sloop Amanda, Captain Edward Dodson. On my passage, I paid particular attention to the direction which the steamboats took to go to Philadelphia. I found instead of going down on reaching North Point, they went up the bay in a northeast direction. 
I deemed this knowledge of the utmost importance. My determination to run away was again revived. I resolved to wait only so long as the offering of a favorable opportunity. When that came, I was determined to be off.